Okay, so um, why don't we do this? Why don't we start talking about uh, your boron or high strength steel here? Yeah. Um, and uh, I already asked a couple of questions about whether you're using um, Taylor welded blanks and stuff like that. So if you can just, you know, yeah. let everybody know what's going on. Sure. So, I mean, when you look at the Cybertruck, everyone thinks about the skin and how tough it is. And we can talk about that and, and whatnot. But the other cool part of the exoskeleton is actually this door ring. It's the world's largest door ring. Um, hot stamp door ring. We do it in-house with a tailor welded blank. And there's no body side outer, right? There's no skin over this. This is the A surface or the, you know, B plus surface that's yeah. on the door inner. And, you know, it's simply coated with a, a black powder just, just for aesthetics, basically. So we're looking at, you know, a, a clean surface here. But it's high strength boron steel, single piece inner and single, single piece inner and outer. And then we just spot weld it together. Um, and we do that down here at the end of, south end of Giga Texas because we had the, it, much like our castings, we had yeah. to make the press. Yeah. Well, uh, stamping press of this, who, who's did you buy? Schuler's or? Schuler? So we have two different brands. We have Schuler and APT. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they, if I was going to do it, that's who I'd pick, mainly because I can get the tonnage and uh, the reliability. Mm -hmm. So that would be my first choice. So at, at the end of the day, I noticed uh, um, there's, uh, you've got a ceiling in here, mm -hmm. and then I feel, uh, I can feel spot welds, but I don't know what they're spot welded to. So this would be. Well, the door ring ends here, yeah. right? Okay, and so kind of that's where. Here. And this yeah. triangle is an extension, just oh, okay. like, like there. So this is actually so this the door would be ring. The shotgun under yeah, this is a typical yeah. shotgun, right? Yeah. And then our casting starts here, right? It's hard to see. Maybe we can go around the other side. Well, you got one right there, right? Yeah. We can. Sure. We can use this one. So this casting here is like right at that A pillar and it's bolted to the door ring here. Um, and that's where you see the sealant come up through the, you know, through the A pillar. Yeah. And the, that shotgun comes down to about here, you know, because right. it's, it's one straight line, right? So we don't have, you know, normally the windshield would come here and then you'd have the hood here. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a big, pretty big casting. It's pretty, I'm, is this, it's uh, not as big as that one. Um, <laughs> so is this like 8,000 tons? No, this is actually a 6,500 ton. The rear, Are you kidding the me? The rear is 9,000 tons. Yeah. How? <clears throat> okay. So um, how it's did just you about keep it flow, together? Right? Like you gotta, yeah. like when you think about tonnage, it's about how much metal you're moving within right. the platen size and yeah. how fast you're moving it. But you can restrict that metal flow by like making bad, you know, feeds in bad directions. But when you look at the side, it, it, you know, the flow, we, we, the biscuit comes in through the middle right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And then we flow it all out and we do it like a river because like metal wants to, liquid right. metal wants to move like a river. A lot of times when you see these people copying us and maybe I'm giving it away stuff, but they, it's an engineer drew it, right? And they drew triangles yeah. and trusses. Yeah. Right. But here at Tesla, we have in-house die designers that sit right next to the guys that are designing the castings and they're going back and forth on simulations so that we can lower the tonnage of the presses we're using by integrating the design of the part into the design of the tool, which is why we don't need necessarily 8,000 ton press for the front. When we started, we thought we would. All we right. said, oh, we're going to need 8,000 tons. But we worked through the team and we actually can make this front one on the same tool, uh, equipment as we make the Model Ys. That's, Not uh, the rear one. That's amazing. The rear one's too big. Yeah, well. It helps with cycle time too, right? Yeah, it does help the cycle time because you get more even cooling across the whole thing. Well, that's the big thing, cooling and, and warpage. Everybody, everybody asks the same question. I mean, how much does this warp? And, and I well, said, well, it happens so quickly, it shouldn't warp at all. But yeah, I mean, it's really about how long we cool it in the dye and you let the yeah. skin cool. And then when you pull it out, we don't have straighteners or anything. So how many, how many presses are, are pushing these out now? We, uh, we have one for the front, two for the rear. But we, as I said, we have the Model Y ones. Yeah. So we could, we have four oh, of those. We can swap the dye out. But we only need two, uh, like, cycle times are down enough to make, you know, 5,000. We only need two presses, one for front and one for rear. So at the end of the day, um, 5,000. I, I, do, you, do you bother with backup tooling then? Yeah, or, we swap the tools yeah, out. Three, so, three uh, sets of dots? So if, well, at least two. If we're running one, then we have one backup. Otherwise, we'll have two in and one backup. And we'll re rework the one while we're, you know, running the other two. And you know, when casting machines go down, they go down hard, Yeah. right? And so you gotta get the tool out and get a new one in quick. Right, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we always have a backup die or it's not even really a backup. It's like we cycle them, right? We're just yeah. rotating and maintaining them to always. So maintaining, I would have thought, well, it depends on, I don't know enough about this aluminum to really, I mean, we, we did an analysis on it, but 
I've never worked with anything quite as exotic as this. So um, what kind of uh, aluminum is nasty for molds. It, yeah, yeah. It's very uh, corrosive and whatnot. And uh, so how much how much time are you spending then on? Uh, well, how we do it is we have inserts in the high heat zones. Yeah. And we have those inserts and they might be co coated with like a nickeloid coating or something on it to yeah. prevent that damage right. from that local area. And then we have our own in-house dye shop. So if that area is getting weak, we'll just replace it with a different with insert. A different new, a new and then insert. the platen yeah. is really what lasts you yeah. know, hundreds of thousands of shots. Right. And, you know, we may be maintaining the inserts, you know, every couple months, every six yeah. months. But, you know, we are making a lot of dyes, which is why we made our own, our own dye shop. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, a lot of people... Um, well, most people are using um, um, Coast Stamp, I guess, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, with their puzzle molds, which I don't quite understand. But anyways, um, that's where most people are going. And if you're doing it in-house, this is this is what me... You like these? Yeah, I do. So uh, you know yeah. what's cool about these ones on Cybertruck? They're actually tapered because we didn't want to machine this. Yeah. So there's, the, there's no so machining just, for the holes or yeah, anything. Yeah, so you just shove them in. So we just twist them in self-tapping and they're tapered. And we have the cool. out external for the bigger ones and then some yeah. of them are internal for the smaller ones. But. And these ones here look like they're going to get a These a are self-tapping. Yeah, yeah self-tapping self ones. And this is the way to make it work. I didn't know you were doing inserts. Um, so Yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's just really like about high strength. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we, the other cool thing about the Cybertruck casting is we actually extended it forward. Most of our casting stopped here and we have a crush yeah. can. This is actually the, the crush can actually is sort of integrated into the bumper, which is only an huh. extrusion. And then this is actually the first, um, you know, part of our progressive uh, crash mode, which yeah. is means it's even bigger, it's longer, and, um, you know, we're incorporating more and more parts. I can't yeah. give you, someone asked me an equivalent number, but we never designed this one yeah, without well, it, so I don't know. At, at the end of the day, that's, there's a couple of things that people don't quite understand. And one of them is, um, how do these things crash and blah, 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 and, Let's just uh, swing over there. One of the things <laughs> on the crushability, Sandy, and I'm sure you've seen it, is we have different size fins from front to rear. Right, yeah. So we have controlled chaos in the, in the, in the crushing. And you can see it even here, like how these build up. And that's so that we know this is going to break first. That section's smaller, the ribs are lower, and then this will get the second, because each one is progressively yeah, stronger. Right. So what is this thing based on? What, what sort of... Um, Physics? Either math or, or, sorry, mass, I should say, or speed or what have you. What oh, you... I mean, the rear crash, you know, of course, we're trying to absorb 305, which is like a 50 mile per hour rear crash. But like really this, this structure is based on the like primary vehicle design. You know, the, all, yeah. all the suspension loads go through here. Yeah. So we're trying to get our torsional yeah. stiffness from this. We're also supporting the bed loads. It's 2,500 pounds yeah. and the towing loads, which is 11,000 pounds. And they all go through here. When you put all that math together, right, then you end up with sort of like an elegant load path structure of trying to get back to our nodes at the batteries and the corners and from back here, then the, the crash really just becomes a fallout of how do I keep that stiffness where I need it for all those loads to, to, to be distributed. And then what can I absorb, you know, when, when I get hit from behind, but cra crash is actually the simple part of these designs now. Yeah. Well, for me, I, uh, I bent the daylights out of the model three, uh, when I hit it with a sledgehammer, and granted, that, that's an 18 pound sledge. Yeah. That's not the kind of thing you normally swing around, but, and I didn't have good access. When I hit the, uh, when I hit the, uh, the other castings, like the, the Model 3 casting, or Model Y castings, I mean, it just bounced off. And in the, in the uh, what do you call it, in the movie or video or whatever, I swung down and hit the shock tower, and the damn thing came popping right back, and. Then I found out that my knee didn't like it. <laughs> so, uh, but it, there was no damage whatsoever. And I'm thinking that this is less likely to crack or break or do whatever than uh, if I have a, a bunch of welded sheet metal together. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's more homogenous and, yeah. you know, it, it's really, it's quite ductile despite its, you know, appearance. And so yeah. you, you, get, you get a lot of flex with it too. 